please let me know. All right, take out our Bibles this morning and uh, turn to the book of 1 John. The book of 1 John, we're in chapter 3 in our trek through this book. Before we get to the reading of God's Word, let's bow our heads and let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to speak to us during this time. And uh, as I mentioned sometimes, as I pray, don't let it just be a time to, to let your mind wander. Let it be a time to actively engage in uh, whether it just be letting your heart ascend to my praying or to lift up your heart to the Lord in the quietness of your heart, to pray that the Lord would take God. God's word and speak to you to make you more like Jesus today. All right, let's pray together. Father in heaven, we come to you as a, a needy people, a people who are in desperate need of your gracious intervention in our lives. Lord, we thank you that in our need that you sent us a Savior to die on the cross for us, to pay the price for our sin. We thank you that you've given us this word forever settled in heaven so that we would not be left to our own imaginations and ideas of how life is to be lived, but that you've given us this word, applicable, authoritative, dependable in all things. So we pray that you would take this word, that you would speak to our hearts by it, that we would go away from this place knowing that we've been in the presence of God, that God has spoken to us, in a way that is undeniable. Lord, in some aspect, I pray that the supernatural sword of the Word of God would touch every heart, making us different people as we go forth from this place at the end of this service today. May this be time well spent benefiting for eternity's sake. We commit this service to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So last Sunday, the message was on chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. And uh, many of you weren't able to be out just because of the impending weather situation. Uh, but the, the title of the message last Sunday was The Pathway to Assurance. So if you weren't able to be here, I would encourage you, just so that you don't miss out on some part of the, of the overall flow of the teaching of the book of 1 John. You know, it's kind of like a bicycle uh, sprocket. You know, you don't want to be missing one of the teeth in that sprocket. So if you missed out last Sunday, I hope that you would go online, whether it be on the church website where you can get a link to both the audio or the video. You can go to our YouTube channel and you can uh, watch the video. So get a, um, so uh, make sure that you catch up on what you missed last week. If you don't know how to navigate toward uh, those things, things, let me know and I'll help you out with that. But we saw that the pathway to assurance is thinking deeply on the truths of the gospel and fighting diligently against sin. Now, both of these things, whether it be thinking deeply on the truths of the gospel or fighting diligently against sin, these are not popular subjects today. There are not many areas, just speaking generally, not just, uh, not just spiritually, theologically, but there are, there are not many areas where we are encouraged to think deeply these days. We might see the, the benefit of expending mental energies at work. I know, uh, you know maybe you have a job that is really taxing mentally and you come 
come home and you are drained mentally because you've been having to work hard mentally all day long. You know, where we might be taught to or encouraged to expend mental energy at school. Young people, uh, school is coming back really soon, right? Uh, and, and I hope you go to school, you're ready to just soak up all that information like a sponge, right? But uh, you're encouraged to think at work, you're encouraged to think at school. But religion is thought of generally by most people. We think of religion as kind of extra. We think of church stuff, religious stuff, as kind of what I do in my, quote, downtime, my extra time. And that's why some people, they just, if they don't have any, any uh, downtime, well, I'll just push church off and it's no big deal. So we're not encouraged to think deeply about our standing before God. The mantra of our day is that the best way to maintain uh, good uh, mental health, the best way to maintain good emotional health is to just kind of think happy thoughts, like Peter, like they said in Peter Pan, right? Just think happy thoughts, you know? You don't want to think about negativity. You want to be full of positivity. And just on Wednesday night, as we, were, we began a series a couple of weeks ago in the book of Nehemiah, I was telling the folks on Wednesday night that it was a very uh, common custom in the court of pagan kings for there to be for it to be a capital crime. It is punishable by death for anybody to come into the court of the king with any sad look or with any down expression or negativity. They you would be execute subject to execution on the spot. Um, so since we have, or so, so we've, we've whittled down the gospel, or we've whittled it down to kind of a, uh, what I've called a, a minimalist Christianity of just what some people might say. It's just asking Jesus into your heart or praying the prayer or some might even say deciding for Jesus. And, uh, you know, minimalist Christianity is, uh, is in many ways, it's an oxymoron. It just doesn't work. There is no such thing as minimalist discipleship to Jesus Christ. We are to be all in, in our commitment to Jesus Christ. Somebody prays a prayer, and then they're told by maybe a very, very well-meaning person, they pray a prayer, and they say, okay, just write down the dates of when you prayed this prayer. Write it down, maybe in the front of your Bible, and if you're ever tempted to doubt, uh, just look at that date and, uh, and remember that there is never any reason to doubt. And we call that kind of teaching, we call that kind of environment, easy believism. Down through church history, others have referred to it as cheap grace. Now, contrary to that... And by the way, you know, uh, so I'm not against, you know, telling, you know, especially when you're working with a child and uh, you refer to salvation as asking Jesus to come into your heart. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that terminology as long as it also goes with a lot more understanding of what this is all about, okay? So uh, Christianity is more than just reciting a prayer. It is more than just something because in in many circles, that sounds more like a magic incantation than a responding to the call of forsake all and follow me that Jesus proclaimed to us. Think about the preaching and the teaching of Jesus. In the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus described a situation where the seed of God's word is being cast out, is being scattered on the hearts of men. Now, easy believism doesn't spend a lot of time on this parable because it really doesn't fit in their narrative. And they would say, easy believism would say that either the seed of the gospel penetrates 
penetrates into the heart, which is salvation, or it does not. Those who are not saved. Jesus described in the parable, parable of the sower that, yes, there was good ground where the seed of God's word is cast and it finds good, soft, fertile ground where the seed penetrates into the soil and sprouts up and produces abundant fruit. But he also described uh, other types of ground, the pathway, the hardened ground where the seed uh, could not penetrate, just stayed right on top of that hardened ground and the birds could soon uh, swoop in and peck that uh, seed right away. But then he described stony ground where the seed uh, came to that ground and did penetrate into the soil and began to sprout up. Because, but Jesus says when the heat of the day came around because there was no depth of earth, that seed withered and it became unfruitful. Then he described thorny ground where the seed began to sprout up, but the seed was cast in an area where, where thorns and brambles were already growing. And though the seed began to sprout up, the thorns of, as Jesus described, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choked out the word so that it became worthless. So in this parable, Jesus describes two situations where there is apparent success. There is, from an outside perspective, it looks like the seed of God's word has found its way into the heart, and it looks like something is going on in this person's life. But it's not true salvation. So the reality is, people can be affected by the gospel. People can be affected by the preaching of God's word. People can even sometimes have a seemingly positive reaction. But yet, while having a positive reaction at first, fall short of saving faith. Jesus spoke of the parable of the wheat and the tares. And the tares which were sown by the enemy into the field of wheat, they looked as they sprouted up next to the wheat, they looked undiscernible from wheat. They both looked the same until the harvest came around. In fact, the enemy sowed the tares, those weeds, into the wheat field to confuse and to hinder the harvest. The message of the gospel is the most important message in the world. Most important message in the world. The message of Christ coming to save sinners. The message of our standing before God as sinners who need a Savior, but that God intervened in order to save us through the person and work of Jesus Christ. This is worth all of our energies. To think on it, to ponder it, to meditate deeply upon this. This is the most important thing that you could ever set your mind to think on. And in our day of constantly being stirred up over so many issues in the world... I mean, every single time you turn on the television, turn on the radio, go online, whatever, every single time you do any, you expose yourself to any of the news media outlets in any way, you are getting your tail twisted, aren't you? They're cranking you right up and then watching you spin. We are being just, we are being stirred up. We are being, you know, by, by every single side, and I don't mean this in any, with any agenda whatsoever, we are being manipulated by everybody at all times. And if you don't realize that, you need to wake up. You're being manipulated by every side. In a day when we are being, when we are being uh, just manipulated and stirred up about every single issue on every single side, 
very often, what is it that gets sacrificed? Our passion for the gospel gets sacrificed. We get so tired mentally. We get so tired emotionally that we've got no emotion or mental energy left to, to really concentrate on these things which are the most important. I've said this many, many times, and I firmly believe this to be true. It is impossible for anybody to be truly passionate about more than one thing. Think about that with me for a minute. It is impossible for anybody to be truly passionate about more than one thing. When people think about you, what do they think about? They think about what it is that makes you tick. What is important to you. And I think that, if we, that most of us, if we really talk to the people around us, we might be surprised as to what we give off the most enthusiasm about. It is impossible for us to be truly passionate about more than one thing. I spend a good amount of time reading old sermons. Generally speaking, the farther away from modern times that you get, the deeper the preaching is. And I'm not talking necessarily about just heady intellectual lessons where you get a, a lesson about uh, original languages and Bible geography. That's not necessarily what I'm talking about. I'm talking about digging in to the deep, profound truths of the gospel and what that that means we are very, very superficial today. We are very anti-intellectual today. We, we don't really spend time and energy focusing and thinking and meditating on these things which are most important. I mean, how many of us have really said, okay, I'm going to spend 20 minutes to meditate on this verse. And I'm not talking about, we think of meditation now as where you just let your mind go and you try to clear clear your mind. No, no, no. That's the opposite of what Bible meditation is. Bible meditation is taking the truth and letting yourself uninterrupted think and ponder and delve deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into the truth of God's word, the truth of the gospel. If you are a worrier, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, if you are a worrier, you are already an expert meditator. You are an expert at meditation. Why? Because you get this thing, and you're thinking about it, and you think about it from this angle, and you think about it from that angle, you think about it from the other angle, and every conceivable and even a few unconceivable angles you think of this thing from, right? That's what worry is. Take that and think about God's word. Take it from this perspective. Take it from that perspective. Lord, would you teach me? Just take this verse, take this passage, and dig deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into it. That's what meditation is. When was the last time that you took 20 minutes and meditated on any verse or any truth from Scripture? I'm going to go out on a limb and say that, there, that I bet we could count on one hand the number of us this week that have meditated on anything from God's Word. Why? We live in a very anti-intellectual society as far as biblical things and religious things go. We think of this as downtime. We think of this as a way to not think when the truth is we need to spend our the lion's share of our energies thinking on this because this is most important. We need to get to know who God is. We need to really subject ourselves to the preaching and the teaching and the study of God's Word and the call of God's Word to believers walking in holiness. And as the pulpits of our churches are proclaiming this, these truths of learning and discerning and meditating on who God is and the, the call of Scripture for believers to walk in holiness, sometimes the result is going to be that believers are going to struggle with assurance. 
I'm thinking about God's call to holiness. And now I look to my life and I see that I fall short of that. Could that possibly mean that I am not a Christian? That's why the Bible calls us in more than one place. It says things like you need to make your calling and your election sure. It calls us to examine ourselves, to discern whether we are in the faith. There is nothing more important than this issue. The reason the Bible calls us to this is because it assumes that we're going to be thinking deeply about these things and that thinking about these things deeply is going to result in us questioning our walk with God sometimes. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Shallow preaching gravitates toward easy believism. And this kind of easy belief, this kind of Christianity is shallow. And on top of that, it is incredibly fragile. Incredibly fragile. When we go through the deep, dark passages of life. When we go through disappointments, bereavement, sickness, what do we need? We don't need the easy believism and the uh, and just the surface level, you know, just uh, turn that frown upside down and think happy thoughts. And God wants something great for you today. That will not suffice us in those days. I need the deep teachings of God's word that, yes, everything is wrong in my life from my perspective right now. Everything is different from what I wanted it to be in my life right now. But I got to remember, God is still in control. That even when I can't understand what's going on, God is absolutely in control of all things at all times. And he has a, a love for me that has not changed. These are the deep, stabilizing truths of the Christian life. In my ministry here, it's not a coincidence that there was, uh, not, not any, nobody will know who I'm talking about here. I, there was one family years ago that regularly complained to me that I was always causing them to doubt their salvation. I mean, this came up over and over and over. Always causing us to doubt, always causing us to doubt our salvation. This was the same family, and this is no coincidence, same family that also regularly complained that I was using big words. To the point that there was a stretch of time of a couple of months where I got on the, on, the back of a, on the back of a bulletin, I would get every week a listing of unacceptable words that I use. And by the way, these were not uneducated people. It's, oh, we just don't want to think about these things. Well, when you don't want to think, when you want to sit there in church and just kind of, you know, let the preacher, uh, you know, dust you off with a feather duster, it's no wonder you're going to doubt your salvation. We need to dig into the deep truths of God's word. We need to, uh, we need to appreciate the deep and the, and, the, and the stabilizing truths of God's word. Surface level is nice for a time, but the surface of the water gets rough. The surface gets choppy. The surface gets unpredictable. Dig down deep and you'll find the rock of assurance that gives you stability even in the difficult times. That's why we sang this morning, my faith has found a resting place, not in device or creed. I trust the ever living one whose wounds for me shall plead. I've come to know my God. You see, men and women, biblical Christianity has been built for hard times. And in times of loss and disappointment and bereavement and profound illness, it's in those times that the believer, as never before, craves the meat of God's word. 
So we're going to get out to our text this morning, John, First John chapter 3, and uh, we're going to begin our reading in verse 19. Now one thing that I want you to notice as we read, beginning in verse 19, continuing down through verse 24, this passage is bookended by one phrase. We find it right at the beginning, and we find it right at the end, and that's the phrase, by this we know. First John chapter 3, verse 19. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall, our heart, and shall assure our hearts before him. And if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is the commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandments. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. You see, salvation is more than a fire insurance policy that comes into play at the moment of death. Salvation is more than that. Salvation is a walk with the Lord that the true believer enjoys. Salvation is a walk with the Lord that the true believer enjoys. The reality of enjoying the Christian life. The reality of enjoying the experience of Christianity is a thermometer to check the health of my Christian walk. The, and, uh, so, and that's often a question that I'm asking myself. Am I enjoying the Lord today? Am I enjoying walking with the Lord? This enjoyment starts with assurance. No assurance invariably is going to equal no enjoyment. So that's, uh, so, so what is the, uh, that? Uh, what is this, uh, what, when he says by this, at the beginning and the end of this passage, what is this? by this. You know, we talked about the pathway to assurance, thinking deeply on the truths of the gospel and, uh, and fighting diligently against sin. But as I'm on that pathway, what do I see? What do I experience that are going to result in assurance? You know, you've been in a situation, I've been in a situation, you're driving along the road, you've been driving for a long time, and then you have that question, especially before GPS technology. You know, you have that question, oh, am I on the right road? Did I miss an exit? Did I, you know, did I, did I miss a turn? Am I on the right road? And so there are periodically along the highway, there are signs that tell you, here is what road you are on, here is what direction you are going. So here is the pathway, thinking deeply, fighting diligently, but along that pathway, there are these signs that remind us that yes, you're on the right path. What are these path what are these signs along the pathway? Number one, love for other Christians. When he says by this, he's pointing back, and we already covered this, so we're not really going to spend the a lot more time on that this morning but number and this is big this is very very important love for other Christians this was covered in chapter 3 verses 10 through 18 and certainly when John says by this we know John has this in firmly in his mind love for other Christians 
every believer finds himself or herself moving toward other Christians and not away from other Christians, all right? We're not just, uh, we don't just speak words of fondness to one another. We're not just speaking words of affection, but John says we are actually engaging in action uh, in a loving way toward other believers, especially these days. I have... Many people that I grew up with, you know, I I went to a Christian school, not for all of my years uh, before college, but for several of the years before college. And so there are many people that I grew up with. They were in church. They professed to be Christians. And they would say, yes, I'm still a Christian. I'm certain of that. But yet, whenever they talk about Christians or Christianity, they never speak positively. They always have something negative to say. And maybe, yes, did you have a bad experience? Did you meet somebody that was a hypocrite? Did you meet somebody? Did you spend time with somebody who in the name of of the Lord uh, did something wrong to you. Maybe you did. But yet, if you are a Christian, the heart inclination is not to be moving away from God's people, but toward God's people. We are going to have a love. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That should be the heart of the true Christian. So when I meet somebody who claims to be a Christian, but they don't attend church, they have zero desire to be with Christians, and especially when I engage with these people and everything they say about Christianity and Christians is full of negativity, I come away with that conversation saying, from that conversation saying, I don't know this person's heart. I am not the final judge of whether this person is a Christian or not a Christian, but on the basis of what Jesus said, I have zero reason to assume that this person is who they claim to be. Okay? If you're a Christian, one of the road, one of the signs along that pathway that should remind you of your standing with the Lord is that your heart inclination is toward other Christians and not away from them. Do you love God's people? Watch how you talk. Watch how you refer to Christians. Number two, a faith that looks upward instead of inward. A faith that looks upward instead of inward. This is a, an important truth. You are, you're a believer. You are growing. You are digging your teeth into the meat of God's word. And so by the, by the reading of God's word, by exposing yourself to the preaching and the teaching of God's word, God touches your heart and inclines your heart to love him more and to hate sin more and to forsake sin. God is giving you, as I just talked about, God is giving you in a way that you can't describe an inclination to unite yourself closely with other Christians. God is working in your heart in this way. You know, I want to walk with the Lord. I want to forsake sin. I want to love other Christians. But what do I find? I find myself in this constant battle. I find myself constantly engaging in the battle against the world and the flesh and the devil. And sometimes I don't give of myself for other believers like I should. Sometimes I'm not what I should be. And it's at those times when my conscience kicks in and alerts me that I'm not right. If you're a Christian, you have an active conscience, okay? If you are a Christian... If you are a true believer, you have an active conscience. Here is something that everybody is born with. The Bible talks about this. Everybody is born with a standard issue conscience. Romans chapter 2 and verse 15 says that the conscience bears witness within us. So here my conscience is constantly keeping watch over what I think and keeping watch over what I do. 
you. Now, when I do good things, when I do right things, my conscience responds how? It responds by giving me satisfaction. When I do the wrong things, when I think the wrong things, what happens? You know, it's like in a, it's like a, it's like in a basketball game. The referee blows the whistle, calls the foul. I didn't mean to point at you, Ed. Sorry. Calls the foul, right? So the, the referee of my conscience blows that whistle and calls the foul. There has been foul play that has happened and there is something, there's going to be a penalty that ensues. But you know, conscience alone is not sufficient. My conscience and your conscience needs to be calibrated by a greater authority, and that authority is God's Word. There are times when my conscience speaks against me, and it is not a legitimate thing. There are times when my conscience, when I have done right, when I've, when I've been faithful, and yet, you know, maybe I'm afraid I've hurt someone's feelings. Maybe I'm afraid that uh, people don't appreciate that I've done the right thing, even though I have done the right thing. My conscience begins to speak against me, but there's been no foul, okay? So it is at those times that my conscience needs to be calibrated by God's Word. There are times when my conscience, when I have done the wrong thing but my conscience doesn't speak against me because my conscience has been damaged and that's on me what happened what needs to happen again my conscience needs to be calibrated by a greater authority and that is the authority of God's word the Word of God informs the conscience by the ministry of the Holy Spirit which is within us. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2 speaks of people who, as Paul told Timothy, have seared their conscience like with a hot iron. They have come to the place where they no longer feel the pang of conscience about certain things anymore. You know people like that don't you? That they can over and over again do the wrong thing and they have done the wrong thing so frequently and so grievously that they no longer feel any pang of conscience about doing the wrong thing. How many people are guilty on April the 15th every single year but yet they've done it so many times, they no longer even think anything about it. And after all, hey, it's the government. No one likes paying taxes anyways, right? What happened? What's going on? We sear our conscience by constantly doing the wrong thing. This happens when we allow the culture to shape and calibrate our conscience instead of God's Word. What does our culture tell us today? Our culture today tells us, hey, you are who you are, and nobody has the right to make you feel negative or guilty about the way you are. Our culture teaches us that feelings of guilt are the major culprits of problems today. Isn't that what the, what the culture around us tells us? That is the biggest problem, and the biggest problem is all these people that feel so guilty about what they do. Understand something. If you are guilty, you ought to feel guilty. Okay? If you are guilty and you don't feel guilty, that's a problem. That go, go down that road long enough and you have sociopathic behavior. Guilt is a good thing. Conscience is a blessing. And we need to pray for an active, accurate conscience that is calibrated by God's word, not calibrated by the culture around us. As a Christian, you've come to recognize your state of guiltiness before God. If you're a Christian, in response to that state of standing before, it is, before God is guilty, what did you do? You repented of your sin and you placed your faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14 says that when God saves us, He cleanses our conscience. He cleanses is our conscience. The burden of guilt has been lifted. 
If you've read John Bunyan's classic work, uh, Pilgrim's Progress, which if you haven't, I would strongly encourage you to read it. It's an old book. It might, t- it might, it might take you a little while to, uh, to get uh, acclimated to it, but it's good. It's rich. And in that allegory, there is this man, and his name is Christian, and he is making his way to the celestial city. He has been warned to flee from the wrath to come, and he comes to the cross, and he is bearing a heavy weight, like a backpack on his back, and it is weighing him down. He's under anguish because of the weight of this load, and he comes to the cross, and suddenly that load falls off of his back, and it rolls down the hill, never to be seen again. That's what happens when God saved you. He cleansed your conscience. He removed the guilt of sin, and we should teach the children to sing that song, gone, 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 gone. Yes, my sins are gone. What a blessing. Your sins are gone. They've been dealt with by the blood of Jesus on the cross. Amen? Amen. Praise God for that. My sins are gone. He cleanses our conscience. But to be a Christian means that you continue to inform your conscience by the word of God. So we pray that God would give us a tender and a sensitive conscience. Sometimes that conscience oversteps its bounds. And instead of being a helper to me in my desire to walk in the joy and the enjoyment of assurance and holiness, it condemns me when I sin. You felt that, haven't you? You probably felt it this week. You fall flat on your face. And what does the devil do? He uses your conscience, he twists your conscience to say, you know, if you were really a Christian, you wouldn't have those kinds of thoughts. If you were really a Christian, you wouldn't struggle with being impatient towards your children or towards your spouse. And the list could go on and on. And this can bring us to the place where you can be truly saved, but yet by a conscience that is affected wrongly and calibrated wrongly, you can completely lose your assurance. When I lose my assurance in this way, where do I turn? When I lose my assurance this way, what is the answer? When I am dealing with the difficulty of a conscience that is like, uh, that is like one catapulted stone after another hitting the wall of my, of my heart and I can, I can sense those walls starting to crumble against this onslaught. Where do I turn? I'm not going to get any benefit by saying, I said the prayer. Somebody told me never to doubt again. I'm like, I see the date written down in the book. It's not enough. You need something deeper. You need something more substantial. It's not sufficient in the day of trouble. So look at verse 20. Verse 20 says, For if our heart condemns us, what is this talking about? It's talking about this conscience that is calibrated uh, by the devil to to, to attack you and to give you no assurance. When our heart condemns us, God is greater than our hearts. Hallelujah. God is greater than my heart. When I think I'm not saved, when I doubt my salvation, it doesn't necessarily mean that that is true. There is somewhere that I can turn. When when our heart condemns us, God is greater than our hearts. And he knows all things. God knows where I am. God knows I'm a sinner. God knows what I'm struggling with. But God saved me anyways. God has looked on me in Christ and has loved me and has clothed me with the righteousness of Jesus Christ at the price of the blood of Jesus Christ. And therefore, as Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 says, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You know, if 
you know, we have a judicial system in our in our nation, right? And if a person if is uh, if a person if a judgment comes against a person on a on a low court level. You have the right, don't you, to appeal that judgment to a higher court. And in certain cases, someone can appeal a judgment all the way to the highest court of our land, the Supreme Court. And if the Supreme Court says, if that Supreme Court dismisses that judgment against you, does the local court then have the right to reimpose it? No. They do not, right? You don't have to be a judicial scholar to figure that out. The supreme authority has already spoken. When our heart condemns us, that's the low level. God has already forgiven us. God is greater. The court of the judgment of God is the highest level. And that's why Romans chapter 8 goes on to say, Who shall bring any charge against God elect? God's elect? It's God who's justified us. That's the, the highest court. Verse 31 says, If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, what does it matter? Who's against us? You see, the believer, when we are facing difficulties in this life, when we're looking for assurance, we don't look inward, we look upward ultimately. The value of faith is not found in the strength of faith. The value of faith is found in the object of faith. So if your thinking is, my faith is strong enough so that I can be saved. My repentance was diligent enough so that I could be saved. My understanding of the gospel was thorough enough that I can be saved. You are on the wrong on track. The value of faith is not in its strength. The value of faith is in its object, and that is in God himself. So instead of being dejected and despondent, the believer is bold. Even therefore coming before the Lord, able to with boldness making requests to Him in prayer. If I've got no assurance that I'm a child of God, what right do I have to come to God and ask for anything? And so John makes this association between assurance and boldness in prayer. I'm not looking inwardly for assurance. I'm looking upward for assurance. Therefore, I can come boldly into the presence of God. He has invited me to come to him because I'm his child. Next submission of my life to God. Now this is closely tied to this boldness and confidence in prayer. My life is in submission to the Lord. Jesus Christ is my Savior and my Lord. As far as He is, 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 has laid it on my heart today, I am following Him. I am forsaking all others. I am following hard after Jesus Christ. I'm walking with Him. So because I am walking with Him, I am learning more and more every day to hate what He hates. I am learning more and more every day to love what He loves. Therefore, when I pray, my heart has been so closely knit to the Lord's that I can be confident that when I ask for things in prayer, I'm asking for what He loves. Just like when two people get married. When they first connect together, they are still learning what makes each other tick. And every man has had the experience early on in marriage of scratching his head and saying, I have no idea why she she's so upset with me. Well, you talk to her like you used to talk to your buddies. It doesn't work that way. You've got to learn how you're supposed to talk to her. You've got to learn to love what she loves and hate what she hates. You can't talk in a brash and a rude way to her like you used to have, your, uh, have talks with a buddy. All right? Every woman has had that same experience. As we grow together, we learn to better love what that person loves, better hate what that person hates. 
And we draw so close to the Lord that we can now, with confidence, come before Him and pray. And we know we're asking for what He wants because we love Him that much. I keep His commandments. I do what's pleasing in His sight. Earlier in this chapter, it said that the believer doesn't practice sin, but the true believer instead practices righteousness. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So, as I said before, I'll say it again, we are not saved by obedience, but if you are a Christian, you have been saved to obedience. You get that? You're not saved by being obedient, but you're saved to obedience. If a person claims to be a believer but does not delight in pleasing the Lord, that person is not a true believer. Plain and simple. John says this is black and white. Number four, the presence of the Holy Spirit. And that's how the passage finishes out. The presence of the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8 and verse 9 says that every true Christian has the presence of the indwelling Holy Spirit of God in their life. Chapter 8 and verse 16 says that the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Spirit bears witness within our spirit that we are the children of God. So what does this look like? What does the indwelling Holy Spirit in the life of the believer look like? It's not a creepy thing. It's not an obnoxious thing. It is not something that makes uh, an object out of itself. It is the Spirit dwells within me. We pray that the Holy Spirit would assure our hearts of His presence. We pray that the Holy Spirit would open up our eyes to the Scriptures to calibrate our consciences and our hearts by what God's Word says and to reveal sin to us so that we can get away from sin and get close to God. We pray that the Holy Spirit would remind us of the greatness and the glory of Christ. We pray that the Holy Spirit would knit our hearts to other believers. That's what we pray that the Holy Spirit would do in us. That's what God's Word says, that if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit is going to do. Do you love God? Simple question, but a question that I would encourage you not to answer in a knee-jerk reaction. Do you love God? Are you enjoying being a Christian? I didn't ask if you enjoy a notion of not going to hell. Nobody wants to go to hell, but the true believer wants to be with the Lord. Are you enjoying being a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ? Salvation is not just a notion of one day joy in the by and by. It is the joy of walking with the Lord every day in this life. If your desires and your loves are mostly the things of this world, if what brings you the most happiness and satisfaction is our things in this realm, you should have no reason to be assured that you're a Christian. Your heart ought to be troubled. Your heart should be stirred up right now. You should be fearful saying, I don't think I am a Christian. Because the Bible says you're probably not a Christian. If things of this realm are what make you happy. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 as we finish up this morning. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not 
on things on the earth. So we're given two commands here. If you are raised with Christ, if you are a Christian, what should be your heart response since you are a Christian? First of all, seek those things which are above. Seek, that is a diligence. That is somebody who is a treasure hunter. Someone who is out there and says, I know it's here somewhere, I'm going to find it. Seeking is like that person. You know, we had the unfortunate experience now three times of my wife losing the diamond in her engagement ring. Found it once, found it twice, third time gone. All right? There was some seeking that went on. There was some scouring. There was some turning over of everywhere that I've been recently. i got to find this thing. That's the word that Paul uses here. Seek these things that are above. Set. Now, set your mind on things above. Not on things on this earth. That is, this is something that's intentional. This is a pursuit. It's a choice. That we must, we must set out to do. And the true believer will. The false professor by these things is eventually going to fall by the wayside. This is the test of whether you truly know the Lord or whether your Christianity is only in profession. Do you have assurance? Should you have assurance? That's the bigger question. Let's pray. Father, we pray this morning that you would give us a keen ability to examine ourselves whether we are in the faith. We pray, Lord, that we would not be satisfied with the surface level that we would not be satisfied with not thinking deeply and profoundly upon these most important truths. Lord, help us to not only be on this pathway, but to be able to recognize these assuring road signs along the pathway that are in the deep and darkest days going to remind us that we're walking in the truth. We thank you that if God is for us, who can be against us? Speak to us, Lord. Strengthen our faith by a sight of Christ today. May we ultimately not be looking inward, but looking upward. We can